Hi, this is History with Andrew Allen, and today is episode 5 of my series, The Formation of the United States of America, Compromises, Compromises, and More Compromises. Before I forget, I include the names of the people I talk about and my sources in the description. As I explained last episode, the Constitutional Convention at Philadelphia officially started on May 14th, but poor roads prevented many delegates from arriving on time. However, the delay enabled the members of the delegations of Pennsylvania and Virginia to bond, since they were the first to arrive. More important, they had time to develop a plan for a stronger national government, which would replace the current system. When quorum was finally achieved, Virginia Governor Edmund Randolph proposed the Virginia Plan, a radical plan, since representation in the new Congress would be decided by population, not allocated equally to states, thus ending the sovereignty of the states. Many delegates had thought that they would merely revise existing articles, not create an entirely new constitution, but they would now have to decide whether to keep the existing government or make something new. The Delaware delegates had been instructed to reject any proposal to eliminate the one-state, one-vote system. However, after a brief threat to leave the convention if real change was proposed, they decided to stay, realizing that the convention would proceed with or without them. The key issue was whether a federal government would gain supremacy at the cost of state sovereignty. After three days of debate, six of the eight delegations that had achieved quorum accepted the idea of a supreme national government instead of a federation of states. At that point, the rest of the convention concerned the exact nature of the federal government. The proposal that Congress should be divided into two houses passed easily, and the motion for popular election to the first branch of the legislature was approved by six states, two states voted no, and two more were divided. The election of the upper house proved more divisive, since the leading nationalists Rufus King, Gouverneur Morris, James Wilson, and James Madison wanted proportional representation in the Senate as well, but numerous delegates wanted each state legislature to select members of the Senate. The issue had not been settled by the end of the first week, so the convention moved on to the debate over who would be the head of the government, which occupied the first week of June. At the same time, more delegates arrived, so both Connecticut and Maryland finally achieved quorum, increasing the number of delegations to 10. Charles Pinckney's plan had proposed a single executive who would be called the president, and this proposal was backed by James Wilson. Adopting a different approach, Roger Sherman of Connecticut wanted the chief executive to be appointed by the legislature, basically a parliamentary system. Although Virginia delegates Edmund Randolph and George Mason feared that a president would lead to a monarchy, most delegates presumed that George Washington would be the first president, so the proposal for a president passed on June 4th, 7-3. to Okay, so how should the president be chosen? The Virginia plan had advocated that the chief executive be selected by the legislature, believing that average Americans were too uninformed. Most delegates preferred this approach. Fearing that the president would be dependent on the legislature, Wilson proposed the creation of an electoral college where voters in each district selected an elector, and the electors would then meet to choose the president. While many delegates opposed the direct election of the president by voters, they were uncomfortable with giving the national legislature too much power, so Wilson's proposal was narrowly approved. Having settled how the president would be elected, the convention then examined the limits of presidential power. The debate over the balance of powers between the three branches of government, especially between the president and the senate, lasted for months. The upper and lower houses of the state legislatures provided clear models for the federal government, but the presidency was a completely new institution. The issue of a presidential veto proved intense, fueled by anger at English governors who would frequently veto legislation passed by colonial assemblies. In fact, most of the states did not give their governors veto power after independence. In the end, the presidential veto was accepted, but it could be overridden by a two-thirds majority in both houses. Wilson wanted proportional voting for the House of Representatives, but it would never pass if the smaller states remained united against the big three states. 
Despite its greater size, New York allied with the smaller states of Maryland, Delaware, and New Jersey because two of New York's three delegates, Lansing and Yates, did not want a strong federal government. The solution was an alliance with another block of states, namely the southern states, the Carolinas and Georgia. They were willing, in exchange, for the continuation of slavery. Actually, slavery was not a very divisive issue at the time. Only four states, New Hampshire, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Pennsylvania, had laws that freed the children of slaves. Oddly enough, Philadelphia had the largest population of free blacks, roughly 2,000, and a small group of them had established the Free African Society on May 17th, a few days before the convention achieved quorum. Clearly, Wilson and John Rutledge of South Carolina formed an alliance. On June 11th, Wilson proposed the motion to allocate congressional seats based on the total number of free people plus three-fifths of all other persons, an apparently nicer way of saying slaves. Why three-fifths, you ask? The three-fifths formula was based on a proposal in 1783 to assign state contributions according to a state's ability to pay, and the wealth-producing capacity of a slave was accepted as three-fifths of a free person. Charles Pinckney had used the formula in his original plan, and Wilson had noticed it. Only New Jersey and Delaware voted against the formula, protecting their interests as small states. Most of the northern delegates voted in favor, rationalizing their acceptance of slavery as the price of a stronger union. While the advocates of a strong federal government had been winning the debate so far, not everyone shared the desire to form a national government. William Patterson of New Jersey was strongly opposed, supported by Roger Sherman and John Lansing, and Luther Martin of Maryland, who had arrived on June 9th. Having spent his whole life in New Jersey, Patterson's provincial outlook clashed with the national perspective, so he naturally wanted to preserve this status quo. Hoping to preserve some of the sovereignty of the states, Patterson proposed what would be known as the New Jersey Plan, which kept the states as independent entities, but gave the Confederation Congress power to raise funds through tariffs and tax interstate trade. Hoping to break the deadlock between large and small states, Alexander Hamilton made a six-hour-long speech on June 18th, advocating an elected monarch, a supreme judiciary elected for life, a senate elected by representatives, who would be chosen by universal male suffrage every three years. The speech praised the British government as the best in the world and stated that the interests of the hereditary monarch would be intertwined with the interests of the nation while calling for the elimination of state governments. But these ideas were so far removed from the goals of the delegates and the speech was so overwhelming in its length that the delegates simply adjourned for the day when he finally stopped talking. This would be Hamilton's only speech during the entire convention. One interpretation is that he was simply frustrated since the other two members of his delegation had been appointed to prevent him from doing anything. Even his admirers would have had trouble describing Hamilton as content to play a supporting role, so the convention must have been agony for him, and he passed the time preparing his ideal plan, and presented it to get it out of his system. Aware that Hamilton's anti-democratic speech might spark more useless argument on issues unrelated to the Senate, the next day Madison made his own speech that examined the flaws of the New Jersey plan. He warned that if the New Jersey plan was adopted, the new western states that would be brought into the Union would have an equal vote despite their small populations. Building on the momentum, his ally Rufus King called for a vote on whether Randolph's plan was preferable to Patterson's plan. Randolph was endorsed by seven states, while only Delaware, New York, and New Jersey supported Patterson, and Maryland was divided. Even Roger Sherman and Oliver Ellsworth of Connecticut voted against it. The New Jersey plan was dead, but the Virginia plan still needed more support to serve as the basis of a new union. While representation in the lower house seemed to have been resolved, the upper house remained problematic. The delegations of Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Delaware, and Maryland were in favor of equal representation for each state. While it would be natural to presume that it was a simple matter of small states versus big states, that presumption would be incorrect, since New York was one of the big states, with the fifth largest population of 340,000 people, and Georgia was a small state with 82,000 people. 
Maryland had 319,000 people, but it had been long dominated by its much larger neighbor, Virginia, so it wanted to avoid the situation in the new union. Eighteen days were spent in fruitless argument between June 15th and July 2nd. Despite later claims that the Founding Fathers had divine inspiration, religion did not play a role. Hoping to diffuse the tension caused by endless argument, on June 22nd, Benjamin Franklin suggested a daily prayer. It was seconded out of respect and then ignored. While the Declaration of Independence begins with God and ends with an appeal to Providence, the Constitution has no reference to religion, aside from the requirement that no religious test shall even be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. And that was initially proposed by Charles Pinckney in mid-August. So it was clearly not a pressing issue. The lack of references to religion makes sense since the Constitution is essentially a legal document, drafted in a period when law was becoming more secular, as references to divine sanction were removed from legal codes. The Declaration of Independence was written to inspire people during a momentous and genuinely dangerous time. Undoubtedly most, possibly all, of the delegates were Christians, but not all were regular churchgoers, and they clearly believed in the separation of church and state. Okay, returning to the struggle over the Senate. Maryland delegate Luther Martin led the battle against proportional representation in the Senate, rivaling Hamilton for the length of his speeches, which occupied much of June 27th and 28th, irritating his allies, who feared that his verbosity alienated potential supporters. By July 2nd, Roger Sherman commented, We are now at full stop. Therefore, he supported Charles Coatsworth. Pinckney's proposal that each delegation contribute one delegate to a grand committee to find a compromise solution. The proposal passed 9-2. to two. The committee included Franklin, who helped to negotiate a compromise where there was a proportionally representative House of Representatives, which resembled the lower house of many state assemblies, and a Senate with equal representation from each state, which resembled the Confederation Congress. Even so, the large state-slave state alliance was poised to win proportional representation in the Senate since there was no New York delegation by this time, reducing the number of delegations to 10 and depriving the small states of an ally. Hamilton had left at the end of June, undoubtedly frustrated, but Yates and Lansing left the convention on July 6 because court season had started and Yates was a judge and Lansing was a lawyer. Two of the four members of the Georgia delegation had also been named as delegates to the Confederation Congress to save travel expenses, since the convention was not supposed to last long. Despite Georgia's small population, the remaining two delegates voted for proportional representation in both houses. However, North Carolina's delegation switched sides. One of Madison's key allies in North Carolina's delegation also left to serve in Congress, and Hugh Williamson, a leading member of the delegation, recognized that the smaller states were agreeing to surrender their sovereignty to the new entity, so he embraced compromise. Earlier, he had stated that, If we do not concede on both sides, our business must soon be at an end. The Massachusetts delegation was divided and could not vote, so state equality in the Senate passed 5-4 to four on July 16th, where each state received an equal vote in the Senate and proportional representation in the House. Although the three-fifths compromise had passed, there was another conflict, namely whether or not Congress could regulate or even end the importation of slaves. The Northern delegates, especially Governor Morris and Luther Martin, protested that the trade would continue forever since it increased the voting strength of the southern states. Morris pointed out that the northern states would likely have to send militia to put down slave revolts in southern states. The debate over slavery became intense. At one point, Pierce Butler of South Carolina shouted, The security the southern states want is their Negroes not to be taken from them. Delegates from the Carolinas and Georgia threatened to leave the convention if Congress was given the power to regulate the slave trade. Again, the importation of slaves was not primarily regarded as a moral issue, merely part of the struggle over export taxes and the power balance between the northern and the southern states. In short, state delegates represented the interests of their states. 
Also, 25 of the delegates own slaves, which explains the reluctance to make any serious effort to end slavery. In the end, another compromise was negotiated. The slave trade would be exempted from congressional prohibition until 1808, basically postponing the problem to the next generation. In return, the South Carolina delegation backed the proposal to eliminate the supermajority requirement for navigation acts, ensuring its passage. The New Hampshire delegation finally arrived on Monday, July 23rd, 60 days after the convention had started. The usual explanation for the delay is the state legislature's unwillingness to cover the travel costs of the delegates. But the real reason was a lack of interest in the convention itself, which proves the rule of secrecy was being strictly followed. Only two of the four delegates actually made the effort, and they must have been stunned to learn that the convention was creating an entirely new government, not merely tweaking the existing one. The new delegates found themselves plunged into the debate over the number of senators allotted to each state. Delegates agreed that the Senate should be smaller than the House and finally accepted two senators per state. While the struggle between large states and small states had been resolved through compromise, a new struggle appeared between the existing states and the states that would enter the Union in the future. A number of delegates, including several Massachusetts delegates, worried that the flood of settlers in the western states would swell their populations until they could outvote the original 13 states, especially in the Senate. Elbridge Gerry of Massachusetts proposed a guarantee that the 13 states together would always have more representation than all of the other states combined. Four states supported the motion, five were opposed, and one, Pennsylvania, was divided. So, it failed. By a close vote, the new nation had decided that new states would be equal to the founding states. The delegates undoubtedly looked forward to their two-week break. Recognizing that they were nearing the two-month mark, Elbridge Gerry suggested on July 23rd the formation of a small committee of detail to edit the pile of proposals and agreements into an orderly draft, and it was unanimously adopted. To sum up, once the majority of the delegations voted to accept a supreme national government rather than a federation of states, the rest of the convention consisted of debates over the exact nature of the new government. Two months of lengthy speeches and grudging compromises had produced a framework of government with a president and a proportionally representative House of Representatives and a Senate with equal representation from each state. The delegates would face the need to prepare the final draft of the Constitution when they returned from their well-deserved two-week break, and I will discuss the debate over the final draft next episode. Thanks for listening.